it's sometimes helpful to take a look outside of the legal arena. And it's sometimes helpful to look to literary, literary characters. And in fact, there's a character by the name of Alonso Quijano who actually lived in Spain. And Mr. Quijano was an elderly gentleman. And Mr. Quijano was an elderly gentleman who spent his days reading. He would read all kinds of books involving knights and knights errantry. And he read so many books, and probably because of his advanced age, that he began to believe that the era that he, era that he lived in was actually the era of the knights, even though that had long gone, long past. However, in his belief, he decided that, well, he did live in this magical, mystical world of knights. And so he made him, he prepared himself, made ready to live in this world of knight character. One of the things that he did was that he went up to the attic and he was able to find the uh, uniform just so they could wear it, such as, as the knight would wear it. Polished it up, it very nice, and it made out of plate, and so it would have deferred or it would have stopped the sword coming out of this suit of armor. And he also found a sword. And he found the sword, and again, he polished it up, and he made it very, very sharp. But a knight needs a horse. And there was this old horse I could barely get around, very old, nag. He decided to name it Rocinante, just to give it that feel, just to give it that flavor, this wondrous horse out there. But it's, again, it's about the facade. It's about the presentation, not about reality. But a knight, in order to go out and do these deeds, has to have a purpose, has to have a reason. There has to be, you, you can't just go out to be a knight to be a knight. And you do these valiant acts for someone. And he saw a young girl walking by one day, and in his mind, he renamed her Dulcinea del Toboso. So he has all of this going on in his head, but he doesn't have the covering, the helmet. That's the one thing that's missing from the armor. So what he does is he decides to form one out of paper mache. And he does a wondrous job of it. It's black, there's everything to it so that it shines. It looks like the actual armor that he has, on, uh, that he already has. But he decides to test it. And he decides to test this by taking that sword of his. Because after all, he is going to go on. He has his lance ready to go. He decides to test it by taking that sword and swinging it. The helmet. That cuts it right in half. So then we start again. He decided, well, I'm going to do it again. Use the same paper mache. Went through the same process again. Shine looks exactly like the armor. Lifted that sword. Go after it again. And stop. He said to himself, no, I'm going to have faith. I want you to trust, even though you already know that it isn't going to work and it's not truthful. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to have belief. That's what they want you to have in this case. And that individual, obviously, is Don Quixote de la Mancha. He redeemed himself. And although here in the United States we've sort of romanticized him, the notion of Mancha, someone who tells and is something glorious to tell after. The book is a little bit different. The book is about an individual who goes senile and refuses to accept the truth, refuses to accept the facts, and then makes up another reality. And when things don't go his way, well, then it's not his fault. It's the necromancers or the magicians who changed, for example the serpents that he was about to attack. And so we get, of course, everyone's familiar with this, his attack on the windmills. He actually believes that these windmills are actually dragons. And so he starts charging on down there. 
Sancho Panza is one believer, which is what Richard Christman wants you to be, is Sancho Panza. His one believer says, don't do it. Don't do it. Those are actually just windmills. Undeterred. Don
this closes as it comes out. If this, and this is the science, then it couldn't have happened the way that the form was It's the first shot we're in here, and there's nothing in the way. There are no voids in here. We know that there can be voids in this. If Daniel Rodriguez did nothing right in his life, Let's assume he did nothing right in his whole life. Well, except one thing. He died without a shirt on. And that was a canvas. Able to tell us distance. Is able to show us whether or not there was something in the intermediate. He did nothing in his life. He was able to do that. At least he died without a shirt. So that we could see this pattern. And this pattern is an undisturbed pattern. It doesn't have any voids. The reason that we know that is because he has a void. He does have a void pattern of stippling in his body. He has both. So that, yes, you can see that there is, there will be a void if something gets in the way, such as an arm. And in this case, we do have a void right here. What that tells you is that there was nothing in between at that point when that first shot was fired. And this was the first shot. And he was leaning backwards like this. Because if he would have been leaning forward, his hands, the way that the defendant demonstrated, well, he would have had to in on his hands because they're much closer to the business end here. It would have been much, because he's holding the bicycle there. He would have had it all over his fingers. If we are to believe what the defendant says, because the hands are much closer. But no, they didn't have that. He didn't have anything here. Nothing other than right here, which indicates that the hands were not in line with the bullet, even though they don't want you to believe that. His hands were here. That's where his hands were. Exactly where Sergio Rochelle told you that they were. What? That's the hand. Right? That's what they want you to do. And in terms of the second shot, you've got to have faith and believe. That's a demise when he says that, you know, that's sort of the first shot. Well, no, when somebody gets shot, it hurts. And people recoil, move away from that. And that's what happened in this case. And it was approximately the same distance so that you could actually see them in the pattern here and then the void. I want you to believe that. No. Don't believe the signs. Don't believe reality. Be magic. Because actually, these rings right here, magic, huh? they can go, even though it's blasting away like a dust storm at 2,000 degrees. On, went on, around, under, that bike frame didn't touch a single stuff. Yeah. Only in the world of sorcerers can that possible. Yeah. I want you to believe it. The other thing that indicates that he wants you to live in this mythical world with him is the issue of blood. Blood spouting out that day. You've seen the photographs. You've seen that the blood was as high as the door here. You saw that the bicycle, which is approximately three feet a little bit higher, also had some blood on it. And you also saw that the box, the mirror, also had some blood on it. And you saw, according to what they tried to prove, they talked about water with Detective Porter and whether or not there was blood there. They tried to show that over and over, that there was blood, maybe forgetting about something in the future that may bring that into more focus. But there's blood here. And according to him, right about here, the box is where he took the shot. You heard that? That means he has to go quite a ways there. This is the area with most blood. This is where he claims the bicycle is broken. If that is where it happened, and the bicycle is up, that 
after the first shot, which is right here to the chest, there's blood that's going to start coming out. And immediately, the way he said, just milliseconds later, the other one goes out, then there's going to be more blood. The lungs are affected. Heart is still pumping. You don't die immediately. Daniel, Daniel or Grace did not die immediately. And so if that's the case, turn around, blood going over there. He's standing there. Well, he didn't get any blood. Magical blood. Because if the blood's coming out in that fashion, it would get waist high, maybe a little higher. But it didn't. He wants you to believe that somehow that blood, or it could be that Daniel and Grievous was standing there. The only circuit that Jill said took a shot. Stops or begin stops pumping when somebody gets near. And lastly, this issue about the black being so high up and being moved in this direction. Again, we're talking about movement here, and movement forward does not stop in the book. It just keeps going forward. You know, body talking about whatever item is being moved forward, and if he is in that position, as he indicated. This way, I would have been in the face. I would have been right around this area like this, the way he demonstrated it, not to the chest. Because, according to him, he was coming like this, right here, the way he hit the face. Stippling doesn't discriminate. Stippling doesn't change. It comes out with the bullet. And that's reality. That's not the world where mythical creatures exist and where magic is the order of the day. In the story of Tony Pope and much actually, he comes to his senses. And he comes to his senses and part of coming to his senses, he has a talk with Sancho Panza. He talks to him about coming to his senses. And in fact, he says, well, you know, it was wrong. I actually stood reading the books and set them in that inventory. And you, Sancho, need to go back where you belong. You go back to reality. You can't be in this world because it doesn't exist. Just like a defendant wants you to join him in that world. It does not exist. It's a world that he wants you to live in. It's a world that where he avoids the consequences of his actions. And that's what he wants. And so, Don Quixote tells Sancho this. And Sancho says, no, I believe you now. One person, I believe you now. I do believe in this magical, mythical world. Every one of them, he has to be a Sancho Panza. He is mythical. I ask you instead to look at reality. I ask you instead to consider the testimony of Sir Jimmy Joe. Instead, to look at the photographs. Consider the science. The testimony of Jeffrey Johnston. And I ask you to consider what their witnesses said. About his attitude. Consider what we know about whether or not he checked his taser and how he was acting that day. Consider all of that, and most importantly, consider the jury instructions. If you do, and if you do not go to this world of fanciful belief, you will find, and I'm asking you to return a verdict of guilty. Guilty of second degree murder. Because there is no justification for killing Daniel Rodriguez. There just isn't. He may be able to believe that, but there isn't. Guilty of the aggravated assault of Daniel Rodriguez. <coughs> Common sense will tell you that killing or bringing a gun and putting it to somebody's head 
will make them fearful, will make them apprehensive. And what can I say about the killing of the dog, Junior? That is absolutely something that should not have happened. The dog was not aggressive. aggressive. According to their own witness, Catherine Black, it was a happy dog, and right before he was killed, he wasn't barking. And after he was killed, if he really was afraid of him, he would continue chewing him because the dog kept moving. It was rendered a paraplegic it moved and he died. I'm asking you to return a verdict of guilty on all of the charges. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, so that uh, Mr. Marins can set up the exhibits, we'll let him do that. Uh, if you go back to the jury room, we'll bring you back as soon as that's done. Uh, please remember the admonition, keep an open mind, don't discuss the case. We'll bring you back in a few minutes. Excuse me.